You're listening to Making the Cut, the mostly true life story of a retired surgeon from 1C Productions. Hi, I'm Rebecca Seitz, founder and president of 1C Productions. This episode contains explicit language and adult content. It is intended for mature audiences only. Completing the immigration form in Boston was a challenge. According to Egyptian tradition, my name is a combination of my grandfather's, my given name, my father's, followed by the family name. So I wrote Amin Marwan Abdelaziz Abdel Magid on the form. Questions followed. Date of birth, sex and color. Color? I dutifully wrote down the color of my eyes, gray-green. Then came some arcane personal questions. Did I have syphilis? Ha! Finally, I faced a bulky, uniformed female immigration officer. I glimpsed mid-calf woolen socks over thick nylon stockings. In a deep voice, she read aloud all my answers, checking each off with her red greased pencil. Is this your full name? Yes. It'll never fit on a credit card. Looking at me, she said, Michael. Yes, Michael, that's a good name. Michael. Michael Marwan McGeed. And with that, she crossed out most of the other names with a red wax pencil. Ray Green, are you being funny, son? You're either black or white. With that, she curiously red checked the rest of the form and stamped passport. With pride in her voice, she announced, Welcome to America, Michael Marwan McGeed. Vanderbilt Hall, the two-story Harvard residence partly covered by creeping ivy, stretched along Longwood Avenue. I reached my second-floor corner room at the furthest end of the hallway by late afternoon. The room's windows faced the Boston Children's Hospital and the Dana-Farber Research Institute, which blocked the daylight. The weak, single, naked bulb could not alter the lack of ambiance. The dark floorboards were disgustingly reminiscent of my dormer in London, stained darkly or ingrained with decades of dirt. The only heat for the freezing room came from a series of old-fashioned lukewarm radiators set under the windows. Welcome to America. I plunked my suitcase on the unmade bed by the window, surprised to see another bed in the corner, with baggage slipped under its metal frame. So I was to have a roommate. I wonder who. Exhausted and jet-lagged, I made my bed and gladly fell into it. The Vanderbilt door monitor told me to catch the Green Line's first tram at 5 a.m. He kindly gave me change for a dollar bill, as well as instructions to feed the coins into the machine inside the first car and get a transfer ticket. I waited in semi-darkness along the track. When the half-empty train came, I was surprised to find it a two-car tram. On entering, I saw people dozing in their seats. The cars rocked back and forth along the open track, running parallel to a street. Eventually, it slid underground as we approached the high-rise offices of downtown Boston. At Park Street, I disembarked. There was no formal platform, so I stood by the track waiting for the red line. At last, a light emerged from around a corner, and a single tram car wobbled down the track toward me, stopping some distance down the line. 
I had to chase it to get on. There was standing room only. The car was crowded with women and men wearing white. One stop later, those dressed in white alighted at Charles MGH Station. I followed them, reasoning they were heading to the hospital entrance. In the early morning mist, crews worked their skiffs on the Charles. It was 5.45 a.m., an unearthly time to start rounds, but a sign that surgery was serious business here. I joined the surgical team, a group of about 20 people outside the emergency room. I was quite conspicuous, wearing a grey suit among the others in white. There were two teams of residents, the white service for private patients and the ward service for indigents. The senior resident, who introduced himself as Everett Sugarbaker, directed me to the second group. The medical students introduced themselves, as did Dr. Levin, the chief resident, who explained the routine we would follow. The welcoming friendliness and my immediate inclusion were entirely different to the reserved, hierarchical British system. Rounds began in the emergency room where we identified overnight surgical patients awaiting a semi-urgent operation. Dr. Levin added their names and the procedures to the daily operative schedule, the infamous add-ons. From the ER, we rode up to the ICU. The institution, the formal ICU, with specially trained and dedicated nurses, was new to me. The concept made sense when I thought back to Mr. Hart's lung patient. The ICU was a physical area of about 16 rooms, distinct from the nearby operating suites. It housed extremely sick patients needing close monitoring and specialized care 24-7, an American idiom. Perhaps some required further operations, in which case their names and procedures appeared on the day's schedule, with an indication of their operative priority. Finally, we started rounds on the ward service. These patients did not have an attending surgeon and often lacked insurance. They were the responsibility of the chief resident, who was in his fifth year of general surgical training. A student presented his or her patient's progress during the night, with the intern chiming in to provide the latest developments or additional data, such as the results of tests ordered during the night. I noticed a professional camaraderie, an attitude of mutual help, regardless of the level of training. The stress of the surgical situation and the common goal of wanting to help patients survive forged solidarity among the different levels of staff, nurses, and students. The sicker the patient, the more the common concern among the group, and the more the individual group members expressed emotional responsibility. All of it strikingly different from the pecking order in England. And then we came upon Mr. Ronaldo, a recent Italian immigrant. He was unconscious and suffering from hemorrhagic pancreatitis, a condition I had never encountered. Intubated and paralyzed, the relatively young patient had an open abdominal wound extending from the xiphoid to the pubis, covered by moist, large gauze pads to keep his guts from spilling out. A tube rested in every orifice, a nasogastric to drain stomach, bile, and GI juices, a foley to empty the bladder, an arterial catheter to monitor blood pressure, a central venous catheter to draw blood, and one to input saline into the abdominal cavity, with a sump suction to drain fluid output. Dr. Sugarbaker must have seen me pale. He explained that at hemorrhagic pancreatitis, the digestive juices were attacking its organ. There was no definitive or curative treatment. What they aimed to do was to wash out the destructive enzymes in the hopes of ending the cycle. Earlier, Dr. Sugarbaker had used a sterile teaspoon to scrape out the dead pancreatic tissue. Binge drinking caused the condition. The effort, energy, and cost invested in trying to save one human being with a self-inflicted illness amazed me. In American medical care and treatment, decisions were not influenced by moral judgment or hopelessness. Medical professionals approached these complicated and challenging surgical problems with a resolve to overcome them. 
Such a work ethos was pervasive and infectious. I let go of the constraints of tradition and wholeheartedly embraced their can-do approach to surgical problems and life in the department. After breakfast in the cafeteria with the other scuds, I took my jet-lagged self to Dr. Gerald Austin's office to sign in. His secretary welcomed me and gave me two Dr. Kildare-type white uniforms, a key to an on-call room, and food coupons, limited to two dollars per day, usually used for breakfast. Dinner was free after the refectory formally closed at 11 p.m., when we could eat whatever leftovers were available. She also said Dr. George Nardi had invited me to his home for Thanksgiving dinner in three weeks. How kind! She suggested I read Dr. Nardi's surgical textbook and that, if I wanted, I could sit for the end of rotation exam on December 15. Wait, what did she say? December 15? My return ticket was December 30. What would I do in freezing Boston alone for two weeks and where would I live? It would cost a pretty penny to change to an earlier return flight, even if I could get a seat during the Christmas season on my inexpensive London-Boston round-trip ticket. That night, fighting even greater exhaustion, I sat down in Vanderbilt Hall and wrote Victoria a lengthy aerogram. My dearest, sweetest, darling Victoria, God knows how much I miss you and how I love and cherish you. If living apart from you is what I'd have to do to get a training here, I'd gladly forsake Harvard just to be close to you all the time. I miss your voice, your aura, your smell, your body, and think of you endlessly. I love you so much. Being alone makes me feel unwanted, unloved, and unfulfilled. I need you by my side, just to feel secure and complete. The medical students at Harvard are a few years older than at UCH, of course. They go to a four-year liberal arts college before medical school. They are mature, seem to know exactly what they want to do in life, and where they are going to live in this huge country. I basked in the spirit of collegiality and camaraderie, overwhelmed by their spontaneous generosity and kindness. I tell them about you, how smart you are, how I adore you, and what a great doctor you'll be. Do you remember Sheila Barton? She was a secretary in Professor Huxley's office, helped me with proofing the first issue of Potential and those that followed. She now works for Dr. Hubble, the new head of physiology here. She had a whole group of students who are with me in surgery over for tea. Funny, really, because no tea was served, only coffee, beer, and soft drinks. We sat about the floor, and when I said that you were coming Sunday, December 10, and that we would be getting married before going to Antigua, Stu suggested that we could stay at his flat near Fenway Park, and Edith offered to give me a ride to Logan Airport to meet you. Apparently, there is a prerequisite three-day residency in Massachusetts before we can marry. And... Imagine this, a federal law that both partners have to have a negative Wasserman blood test for syphilis. They discussed potential solutions to solve our tight schedule. Please don't worry, my love. I'll find an answer and share it with you in my next letter. I will overcome all barriers in my determination to make you mine. Remember, you are the most precious woman in my life and will soon be together. In the meantime, I send you kisses, lots and lots, on your four lips and four cheeks. Love always, Marwan. When I mailed it at the front desk, the clerk said my letter could take up to a week to reach London. Unacceptable. I decided to telephone. As I stood in Vanderbilt's phone booth armed with a handful of coins, a very sweet and young-sounding AT&T operator helped me reach Victoria. She was not in her flat in London. I found her on the Isle of Wight. We were overjoyed and immediately comforted to hear each other's voices, so clearly, almost as if coming from next door, instead of the thousand miles from across the Atlantic. 
Oh, it's so good to hear your voice. I wish you were standing right next to me so I could hug and kiss you. Darling, I miss you so much. I discovered the rotation ends on Friday, December 15, a whole two weeks early. Does that mean you'll be coming home earlier? Since I'm here, I thought you could come and we could go for two weeks to Antigua. What do you think? The minute I said this, I felt that nice boys wouldn't suggest this. She would immediately know that I wanted her body, that I missed her and loved her intensely. There was a slight hesitation on the other end of the line. Did she perhaps feel uncomfortable? We had never gone away alone. We could get married here in Boston and then fly to Antigua. What do you think? Oh, darling, that would be wonderful. M Mother, Marwan has offered to marry me and we'd honeymoon in Antigua. As we hastily talked while I fed more coins at the prompt of the operator, our plans developed and unfolded, created in the mania of love. We would marry in a registry office or at the British Consulate in Boston and have a Caribbean honeymoon, at a time when only the rich and famous, including Princess Margaret and other British royalty, scandalized those exotic isles. I'll look for a flat so when we return we can be together. Oh, darling, I love you so much I can't wait to be in your arms. December seems so far away. I can't wait. There's so much to do, what with end-of-term finals, getting clothes and flat hunting. I love you. I love you. I've got to go. I've run out of coins. Right soon. I felt cold, hungry, and lonely. I remained in the dimly lit tobacco-reeking cubicle, hanging on to the receiver, not wanting to let her go. I had ensured her welfare and reputation. In my loneliness, there was no one to reassure me. No one to tell me that my plans for this new life are the right ones. The next day, a letter from Victoria arrived. She had started writing it a couple of days after I departed. Remarkably, it only took two days to reach me. I could hear her voice while reading it. Darling, how are you, my faraway love? I miss you. Life has become a vague mixture of carrying on, which I feel apart from, if you see what I mean. I feel dissociated, as if part of me was elsewhere i.e. is and was you. I love you. So many questions to ask you, so many things I didn't manage to, but wanted to say when you left due to my emotions. I, I, I don't think I even wished you bon voyage. My aerogram had arrived in time for Victoria to add another paragraph to her first letter to me. She was pleased that... Life seems fine in Boston. And she concluded with... I love you forever and ever. In the dimness of my cold dorm room, her words were sublime, reassuring and assuaging my loneliness. I read and reread her letter, dreaming that she was in my arms. I forced myself to put it down and go back to the hospital. I'd barely arrived back there when the residence pages went off simultaneously. The team took off like a stampeding herd, scampering en masse down the stairway. Unsure and confused, I followed and caught up with them outside the ER door. An ambulance, a fire engine with flashing lights and two police cars surrounded the scene. A blur of white-dressed bodies stooped over a man on a gurney, one pumping his corpulent chest with vigor, shouting out orders for meds. With focused intensity, a nurse drew them up from a cardiac cart. She handed a syringe to the team leader, who stuck the long needle straight through the undershirt into the patient's heart. Another resident frantically tried to start an intravenous line. Nurses attempted to cut off the man's trousers, while others pushed the gurney into the building. I was a helpless follow-along, never having witnessed or learned to participate in a cardiac arrest. So much still to learn. The effort continued in the ER, with the patient surrounded by police, nurses, and residents. 
They intubated and oxygenated him. They stripped him naked and hooked him up to the monitors. After 30 minutes, with no response from the patient, the attempt ended. They pronounced him dead. He looked so pale and young. The nurses had pieced the story together by now. The deceased had visited his girlfriend while her husband attended church. During intercourse, he experienced chest pain and lightheadedness. Fearing a scandal, she dressed him, which explained the malaligned buttons on his shirt and his poorly fitting trousers. She clothed him in his winter coat while he was floating in and out of consciousness, losing valuable time before she telephoned his friends at the fire station to keep matters confidential, instead of dialing 911. As the tightly woven resident team drifted away from the lifeless body, I joined them. We left a chaotic scene of syringes, blood and catheters and clothes strewn on the floor, presumably for the nurses to pick up. Our usually upbeat, can-do spirits were akin to water, slowly draining out of a sink. What would be the effect of repeated patient failures on our psyches over a lifetime? The low energy level lasted only until Dr. Sugarbaker called us to order and reminded us of our tasks for the day. Some to assist in the OR, others to the wards. I was to help Dr. Hermes Grillo, who, like Pilcher, was a thoracic surgeon. I met him at the scrub sink where he introduced himself. Immediately after scrubbing, we dipped our arms into a vat of alcohol up to our elbows, a sterility method I was sure would soon catch on in England. We toweled off, and the nurses dressed us in sterile paper gowns and gloved us, all while Dr. Grillo related pleasant memories of the various times he had spent in England. Today, with me by his side, Dr. Grillo would reconstruct a man's trachea, the windpipe located at a high level in the neck, under the thyroid gland. The tracheal rings were damaged when an emergency tracheostomy had been performed, and a tracheostomy tube was inserted during an emergency resuscitation, elsewhere, several months previously. After washing down the patient's neck and draping it, Dr. Grillo handed me the scalpel to make a midline neck incision. He then opened the neck, exposed the trachea, and excised the damaged ring, speaking quietly, giving a blow-by-blow -blow description of his actions, while he mobilized the rest of the trachea in the chest, freeing it from its attachments to the surrounding lung tissues. He reconstructed the continuity of the windpipe by sewing together the upper and lower sections. I had never seen such an operation. I merely held the skin retractors to give him the exposure he required, and ensured his operative field was as free of blood as possible. I returned to Vanderbilt Hall to find a second letter from Victoria. Darlingest, I had to write. I've been missing you so very much in spite of all the things I've got to keep me busy. Work, of course, in addition to all the little things that need doing each weekend. Oh, darling, I love you so much and I hope we won't have to go through this separation again, at least not for a long time. I love you very much. Very much. I just want to see you and hear your voice. I expect there's a letter for me somewhere between Boston and London, so I look forward to seeing it in the letterbox one morning soon. I love you, darlingest. I savoured every word, seeing her writing it in my mind's eye and wanting to take her into my arms, cling to her, kiss her, and love her. A day later, another letter arrived. Nothing definite about flat. I, I shall make an all-out effort to find one in the next few weeks. Your letter got here in three days. There was no postmark stamp on it. We'll mail letter tonight. Oh, darling Marwani, with lots and lots of love from your little Vicky. Back at the hospital, 
I was reluctantly drawn into a vascular emergency procedure. The vascular service's chief resident, a man with seven years surgical training, and his crew of fellow residents wheeled in a middle-aged patient with an embolus that had lodged in the main artery of the leg. There were no measurable pulses in the foot by Doppler echogram, and the appendage was cold and white. Nightmarish flashbacks of my time on the evening of the Christmas ball, operating with Mr. Hart, flooded my mind. I pushed against them, forcing myself to note that the operating room here was well equipped for vascular surgery having overhead X-ray equipment worked by a radiology technician who was also in the room. The appropriate instruments and specific sutures were available. Despite my dread, this operation could and would be different. The chief resident placed special vascular clamps above the artery to prevent hemorrhaging when he made a small cut into it. He passed a vascular catheter down the leg, once the overhead X-ray scan showed its opaque tip was beyond the suspected clot, he inflated a small balloon and then slowly pulled back the catheter into the incision, returning clotted red blood and a denser white embolus. The leg almost at once pinked up. They placed the embolus on a green towel covering a side table. There was a general aha among the residents. I missed its significance. The white mass was a crucial piece of evidence, but I wasn't sure in what regard. An air of satisfaction filled the room, though, as the chief resident carried the specimen off to the lab, leaving his juniors to close the wound. The pathology report, ready that evening, showed the white embolus to be myxoma tissue. It could only have originated from a tumor of the heart. 75% occur in the left atrium, the small chamber sitting on the ventricle. I read about the condition in the library, waiting for the cafeteria to close to the public so I could freely gorge myself on the day's leftovers. A few days later, the heart-lung pump team stood by ready to help divert the blood from the heart after they cracked open the patient's chest. The uniqueness of the case drew a crowd of spectators, who stood three deep to watch the operation. On walking in, I first met my benefactor, Dr. Gerald Austin. After a very gracious and welcoming introduction, he placed me on a stack of stools for me to observe the procedure over the heads of the crowd. Once the patient was on the heart-lung machine and the heartbeat stopped, the tension in the room rose as his resident opened the right atrium and cleared it of blood. A beautiful, delicate sea anemone-type tumor, a few millimeters in size, grew on the cusp of the mitral valve. There were no other tumors. With the elan of a perfect golf swing, the surgeon swiftly cut the tumor off the mitral valve cusp to a crescendo of cheers. It was my first time observing open-heart surgery. I felt faint and stumbled off the stools into Dr. Austin's arms and blacked out. Lying in bed that night, I reflected on events of the previous few days. The level of eagerness among the residents and my fellow medical students astonished me. Their dedication to surgery and teaching was impressive. Their resolve when it came to patient care like nothing I had seen before. An atmosphere of enthusiasm and a willingness to extend the boundaries of surgical knowledge, free of the constraints of tradition or rank, flourished here. Mass General was the mecca of surgery in the U.S. Northeast. The complexity and spectrum of surgical diseases and the numerous feats of operative skill left me in awe. America was like a tempestuous teenager, full of energy and vigor, while Britain was the sedate grandparent straight-jacketed by customs. Despite my admiration and respect for traditions, I quickly grew addicted to the vitality the can-do attitude that surrounded me in Boston. Even a snowstorm that left me stranded in the hospital for three days did not dull my enthusiasm for this new place. The residents and faculty appreciated my zest for work, encouraging and reinforcing that element of my personality. Unlike in England, in this society, expressing enthusiasm was not disdained. 
Should I get my surgical training here, instead of England? I decided I might as well explore the viability of it. Telephonically, I arranged to have two interviews in New York on Thursday, December 14, Victoria's 23rd birthday. The early morning interview would be at Columbia with the surgical program director, followed by an early afternoon interview at the Roosevelt, a private hospital. I hoped Victoria did not mind my making arrangements to do interviews before hopping our plane to Antigua that night for the honeymoon. At the end of the week, I wrote Victoria an account of my week's numerous operations. I also mentioned my surprise that one of the surgeons who had come from London had a mistress here in Boston. Such matters occur in both Egypt and Europe and are not generally discussed. I don't know why someone had told me of the man's business. Victoria wrote back. Your work sounds fascinating. Hope it's not too hard on you. I'm glad you're having such fun, re dinners, etc. How do you know that the English surgeon had a mistress while he was there? This is the thing I don't like about men. They assume if they're away from their wife for any length of time, they're expected to, and thus do, have a mistress. Oh, this isn't a dig at you, my love, not, not now, but I hope this won't have to ever happen in the future, although it would be partly my fault if it did. I'm longing to come, but there's just so much to do, I don't know where to begin. A flat, end-of-term exams next week, fun, drinks, party, Christmas pies, and keeping sane. My darling, I will write tomorrow in less of a hurry. I love you and want you. All my love, your Vicky. Her response stunned me. Never mind who it was or if it was true or mere gossip. Her assumption that a mistress would be partly her fault also disturbed me. Was she projecting the sins of her father? Three letters arrived the following day. Mother, Omar, and Victoria. Victoria had rapturous news. She had found a small, cheery flat near the hospital. Have I told you? 15 Albany Street, Regent's Park, NW1. I hope we'll be happy there together, my love. She had penned fourteen kisses. How I wanted each one. I imagined them on my lips. Omar's letter wished Victoria and me a life of happiness. I opened Mother's letter with trepidation. After all the negative vibes about my bride, I hoped it had an encouraging tone. Well, son, I had a long conversation with Vicky tonight when she informed me of the delightfully small flat she found at long last, suitable situated near Portland Place. I feel sure you both have a happy and satisfying life and careers before you. She is a sweet girl, and you will be happy together, the best foundation for a true partnership. I hear from Vicky that you are returning on 1st January, in this case, I shall have my bunions cut off at the end of January. Much love, Mother. At least she wished us well now. A run of sunny days raised my spirits. Letters from Victoria arrived almost every other day. This feeling of being unconnected was a source of anxiety. I wrote to Shirley sharing my enthusiasm to have her daughter as my wife. I regretted that neither she nor Tim would be present at our formal marriage and reassured her that after my qualifying exams in May, we could have a wonderful reception enabling her friends and family to attend. She responded immediately. I am delighted for you to call me Shirley, much better than Ma-in-law. I enjoy reading all the nice things you said about Vicky. So did she. It sounds as if you're having a very interesting and useful time. I knew you would make friends quickly. I'm sure you always will, wherever you go. This will be a great help to Vicky. Shirley. Perhaps I would be promoted from wog to son-in-law. Victoria continued to pepper her letters with, I love you. Yet I yearned for our passion and intimacy. I began to read, I love you as a platitude. 
I wanted bold words of encouragement, emotional words, phrases, sentences that vividly expressed a romantic and erotic longing for me, for my body. Were we in harmony erotically? Another letter arrived. Darling, I so long to be with you, just to be in your arms and be warm and scrunched and lying near your warm, alive body. Yummy. Mm, wonderful. Back in London, Professor Pilcher retired and the surgical unit at UCH was in upheaval, putting my original plan to apply for the house surgeon's job in jeopardy. I suspected I did not stand a chance compared to a British candidate anyway. Perhaps after marrying Victoria and getting my BTA, I might be viewed differently. Nevertheless, I had to develop a plan B. I asked Dr. Sugarbaker how I would set about applying for residency. He told me that since I was interested in general surgery and wanted some research experience, perhaps a better fit was the Peter Bent Brigham, the other Harvard training hospital chaired by the dynamic Dr. Francis D. Moore. I telephoned Dr. Moore's office and his secretary gave me an appointment in two weeks. A quick calculation showed me that this was the day after Victoria arrived. I would have to mention this in my next letter to her. Another interview right at the start of our honeymoon. A fellow student warned me about the need for a Wasserman if Victoria and I were to marry in Boston. The Wasserman is a document required by the state of Massachusetts that certifies neither the bride nor groom has syphilis. How archaic. Still, it must be obtained. How would I pay for it? My fellow students suggested I donate a unit of blood for which the hospital would pay me $50. I would use that pay for either Victoria's or my test. While I was in the blood bank, I could meet the chief, a surgeon, who ran it. My colleagues felt sure that prior to the donation, they routinely checked the donor's blood for syphilis, permitting the chief of the blood bank to attest to my negative status. Perhaps I could persuade him, given the mitigating circumstances, to sign the form stating that Victoria, too, was syphilis-free. I headed to the blood bank and met the chief. Oh, I know you, C.H. My time in London at the National Institute for Medical Research was a particularly wonderful experience. Uh, tell me about your bride. Was she previously married? No, no. She is a medical student who comes from a proper and conservative upper-class British family on the Isle of Wight. I used to go sailing down there. Great fun. In fact, when I met her, <clears throat> I think she was a virgin. You will enjoy meeting her, for she is arriving next Sunday. He nodded sympathetically, producing a form he signed, attesting that she too was syphilis-free and the proviso that as soon as she arrived on Sunday, she come to the blood bank to have a blood drawn. And I do mean Sunday. I would need to return Monday morning to collect both our forms. Everything was falling into place. Victoria would arrive on Sunday, December 10. I'd bring her to meet the chief on Monday, we'd get the Wasserman, and be married, probably on Tuesday. After the ceremony, we would go to New York for my interviews at Columbia and the Roosevelt. Then, on December 15, we would board a flight to Antigua. I could just picture us on that golden beach, holding hands and relaxing, married, together, forever, at last. I rushed to telephone Victoria with the good news. Now I just needed her to cross the pond safely. I couldn't wait to hold Victoria in my arms again. Thanks for listening to this project from 1C Productions, where thought-provoking media comes alive. Be sure to check out other 1C shows, like Free Evangelic, in which a married couple discuss their walk out of lifelong evangelicalism and into a new way of being. Their search for truth might open doors for you as well. Learn about Free Evangelic and other 1C Productions podcasts at JustOneC.com. That's J-U-S-T-O-N-E-C dot com.
You've been listening to Making the Cut from 1C Productions. Making the Cut was written, produced, and directed by Rebecca Seitz, based on Michael McGeed's manuscript, Mastering the Knife. Noah James played Michael McGeed. Other characters brought to life through the vocal talents of Nicola Waldron, Michelle Tischer, Trisha Brio, and Kay Alluvian. Audio engineering provided by Zischer LLC. Making the Cut theme music by Kyle J. Baker. Learn more at makingthecutpodcast.com.